Traditionally, Blizzard or a game studio owns all the IP, they own all the characters, they own all your items, they own all data you've produced while playing the game. And in the blockchain gaming world, the IP is owned by the users. The designer doesn't really own it anymore. If you think about all the value that game studios capture for themselves, if you have these systems where the users own all their items, all of the value that gets accrued, a lot of it will go to the DeFi protocols. Imagine you have an item that you can use in multiple places. If the users own their items, the value capture is done by the protocol. All right, guys, so we're here live from Token 2049. I'm here with Tarun, the CEO of Gauntlet, an amazing guy who just gave a really interesting talk on the panel about DeFi and the future of finance. Tarun, thank you so much for coming on the show, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome to have you, Tarun. And you have a fascinating story, like growing up in the US, in New York, and I'd love to kick off with simply asking you what made you fall in love with this crazy space? What is your story? What's your background? Yeah, so I spent the last 10 years working in... Um, sort of what is called simulation-based research. Basically, uh, it, the fir my first job sort of that I worked at was at a place called D.E. Shaw Research, and we were building uh, ASICs, but not for crypto, for doing sort of like a different type of high-performance computing application. And in 2012, uh, we were you know, building this chip, and we basically talked to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer's like, okay, send us $25 million, so we sent the money. And then... The sort of supplier ghosted us for like six months and afterwards like, hey, we'll give you a 10% discount. And that was when the first sort of like Bitcoin ASICs were being built for mining. And that was when I was like, wow, people are taking this seriously. Like, this is a crazy thing. I should go mine. So I mined a bunch of Bitcoin, sold it all at the bottom in 2013. Oh, no. uh, and then kind of was like, ah, I don't really understand why this is kind of growing. But in 2015... I started noticing the academic papers. The quality got a lot better um, in terms of like being able to describe why uh, these systems were able to survive. So briefly speaking, traditional distributed systems have certain properties that they need to satisfy. And somehow Bitcoin does not naively satisfy those properties. So you would say, oh, the network could, well, could fall apart and go down quite easily. But then in practice, Right? We, of course, saw from inception to you know, now, of course, that it's worked amazingly. Right? And so there is kind of this gap between the theory of d distributed systems and the practical, actual use of them. For instance, in my work, we were building you know, custom hardware and distributed systems, and no one really believed that, that Bitcoin worked. It was, everyone was like, oh, there's just like, there's, only, there's not that many nodes or there's like some kind of like real, like hidden reason that's centralized in some way. But in 2015, I think that was when I was first convinced. Um, there was a bunch of papers that came out that year that really strongly were able to prove that Bitcoin was able to achieve these properties that people sort of want theoretically when just designing data centers, designing like, like uh, exchanges, like centralized exchanges. Those properties actually hold, but only sort of in this like probabilistic sense, like most of the time. Down, I went down that rabbit hole, and then by 2016, um, I think sort of the first proof of stake papers started coming out that were more formal. Again, I, my background is in, in math and, and physics, and so I, I was kind of like looking for the the like actual like meat and potatoes formalism, not kind of like hey, I someone tried something on a forum and maybe it worked. So the original proof of stake papers came out at that time. And one thing I thought that was really cool about them was there's all sorts of novel cryptography getting used in practice. So these are all things that you like learn in class. Uh, but like usually maybe there was like one implementation or it's like a grad student project. You don't see them actually getting used in production and these systems had to do that. However, one thing I did note uh, at that time, which I knew now is much more obvious, but I think then people were not so cognizant of this, was that proof of stake has a different type of security model from the perspective of like how it behaves as a financial asset. So if I want to take over 
say, a proof of work chain like Bitcoin, I need to actually amass 51% hash power. And that means I need to either buy that, spend that much energy, or I need to borrow hash power from, from mining pools and get them to agree on my attack fork. On the other hand, in proof of stake, someone could actually just borrow the asset itself and then be able to use that to take over the network. And so in some sense, in, in, in proof of work assets, there's a separation between the asset that's actually being traded and the asset or resource that's being locked to generate the currency. So you know, proof of work, it's really locking up hardware and energy in order to generate Bitcoin or ETH. Uh, whereas in proof of stake, it's the staked asset itself which is much easier to imagine people kind of find a way to make a borrowing market or a derivatives market that um, allows someone to do kind of some of these malicious attacks. So that led me down this rabbit hole of like, hey, you know, I, at that time I was working in high frequency trading. And so we did a lot of work where we did simulations of like our strategies versus other people's strategies and we'd run them and say, you know, try to optimize them that way. And I was trying, I had this idea of like, hey, why don't I take this kind of the way people think about this stuff in high frequency trading or algorithmic trading uh, to stress test trading strategies and measure risk. Why don't I try to do that against these proof of stake networks? And so then that led me to meeting a lot of people who were starting these kind of layer one protocols that raised a bunch of money in, in 2017. I started doing, and like, I was like, hey, have you guys like thought of this problem? And they're like, no, do you want to work for us? And I was like, not really, but I'll do consulting. And then effectively that got me out of my job because I was like, oh, this is great. I can like do this research I was doing for fun anyway on the weekend. Like, and someone <laughs> wants to pay me to do it. I think people started to realize this was actually a real thing. And uh, I think that summer someone tried to acquire my one person consultancy. And I was like, all right, there's clearly something here. Uh, and so then I started Gauntlet, and we were really focused in the beginning on doing risk, financial risk measurement of proof of stake networks because of this kind of thing I was saying earlier, which is I, I could theoretically take over the network by borrowing enough assets, which means I, if the liquidity of the proof of stake asset is very high, then someone could actually execute the attack. Um, that was sort of where we started, but over time, by 2019, um, it became really clear that like DeFi, like prop, when Uniswap hit a $10 million TVL, that was sort of the moment at which uh, me and my co-founder were like, okay, we're just like dropping the proof of stake analysis and moving 100% to, to measuring risk in DeFi. Mm -hmm. So this is like maybe May 2019. So ever since then, we kind of like wrote some of the first academic papers on, the, on a lot of this stuff and established sort of like how you should measure risk, what, what risks exist. Overall, the main core thing that we do is we've built this sort of like simulation engine for simulating all these different types of attacks and different types of edge case scenarios so that we can take in new market data, take in new borrower data, take in new on-chain data, run these simulations and make predictions about how safe or unsafe certain uh, protocols are and like whether they should change things. Absolutely fascinating. I have like 100 million questions to follow up on, but I guess three of them that if I, if I may follow up on. Number one is, is the 51% attack like Bitcoin's nemesis? Is it real? Is it too costly to actually happen would be the first one. The second one, you talked about Bitcoin's properties. Which one are you really in love with? And then maybe actually later we can talk about risk. But the 51% attack would love to hear your say on this. Is it the ultimate nemesis? Is it the scariest point? Can it happen? Is it a bit of fiction? To start off, that'd be great. For sure. I mean, it's <laughs> happened on smaller networks, right? Yeah. So there are hash power aggregation services for GPU networks in particular because it's easy to point your GPU at a new uh, chain versus like an ASIC is usually like the hash functions baked in. That's like custom to that particular chain. So we have seen such attacks because there are these borrowing services that let you borrow, G you can pay per hour to, to borrow GPU power to mine a certain chain. And that's like nice hash, for instance, this is one example of that. And those services have been used to attack small chains. So it's certainly when you're bootstrapping or you're a small, relatively small chain, it does work. But when you're at Bitcoin scale, it's impossible to imagine someone aggregating that. Because in some ways you need to not only control 
just the raw hash power. But in order to execute that attack, you really need to control the supply chain of the energy production, like all the green energy places that are you know used for Bitcoin mining. You'd basically have to take over all the data centers there, and and you'd have to do that over all the countries that are mining. And so it's not it's not it's much more infeasible when you're the top dog. When you're kind of a smaller proof of work chain, that's very it's a very different story. So is that like the strongest property for Bitcoin? Like it is the ultimate or the most secure ledger, distributed ledger out there? Like what is your favorite property or personal property where you where you felt like, oh, Bitcoin is just so awesome. I love it for this reason. Not to go too much into the jargon, but the 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 two properties that uh, computer scientists care about in a distributed system are uh, at a very high level. One of them is called safety and one is called liveness. Mm -hmm. So safety refers to the fact that if I submit a transaction to the ledger um, it, and it makes it in, it won't be removed after it's been in the ledger for a certain amount of time, right? Um, so that's why when you, you use your wallet or you go to an exchange, there's this notion of confirmation time. That's sort of this, how long do I have to wait until it's safe? Liveness is the property that the network can always keep receiving new transactions, that it, it, it doesn't go down. So for instance, the, the Facebook thing that happened, yeah. that's a loss of liveness in some way. So a, a, a good network needs to have both properties. Now, in classical distributed systems, like the stuff that is running in every data center in the world, that stuff gets safety and liveness in a deterministic sense that it, it guarantees them with 100% certainty. Um, but by doing that, it's actually much more costly and effectively needs a centralized force to, to, to relay messages and, and do other kind of state management. When Bitcoin came out, people were sort of like, how can you get safety and liveness in this thing that's sort of like probabilistic in nature? Like people could fork and like that fork could last for, for thousands of blocks and then people switch back. Um, and the idea is that you can get safety and liveness in this probabilistic sense that um, once uh, a transaction's in the ledger, after a certain number of blocks, the probability that someone can actually revert it uh, decays really, really fast. And, and it becomes so hard to do without like owning more than X percent of the network. And so I think the, that the fact that you have this flip, it kind of flipped the entire thinking in decentralized systems that had existed since the 70s, that uh, you needed these kind of deterministic, exact notions of, of safety and liveness. You could actually have this probabilistic notion. And that is the quintessential key thing to almost all crypto systems, is that we were able to get, we were able to relax this sort of deterministic uh, thing. But now we actually get a lot more kind of like, we get much more resiliency in the, the system. Fantastically put. And I have a question related on proof of work versus proof of stake because obviously you have analyzed different risk parameters, which is fascinating. And when I look at your very cool green hair, you know, a lot of people are worried about how proof of work is not green enough. How are you seeing this whole debate on, you know, how the US kind of flipped on Bitcoin earlier this year? What is your response to those types of criticism? And do you see a, a brighter future further down the line? Yeah, I think, you know, in some ways, uh, I do think there's a bit of overselling in a lot of ways of this like proof of stake is green thing. Running a node that a lot of the proof of stake nodes just generate an enormous no amount of, take an enormous amount of disk space. So like running a Solana node on your own computer is actually quite an arduous task. And if you, if you, if you go through the exercise, you'll see that these things are not like energy free. Like they are like data center computers. Um, that being said, of course, it's still less than, than proof of work. I think the difference in security models between proof of work and proof of stake is sort of fundamental in, 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 in a lot of ways. Um, I prefer to think of it as like proof of work is like the mint, like, you know, the treasury that controls the, the currency supply. It has to have like extremely strong guarantees on when it can be reverted. Whereas I think of proof of stake, like U.S. equities, it's something that's like usually right, um, but it's like, you know, it can have more a weaker security model. Um, but if we look at sort of the difference between sort of the gold slash mint treasury versus U.S. equities, the U.S. equities market is sort of 
bigger than the gold market, right? And so proof of stake is something that I think can support assets that don't need as much security, um, but can interface with, with proof of work. But I, I still sort of feel like proof of work at its core, you know, the fact that it's very, very difficult to borrow enough, asset, sort of borrow enough physical resources to execute the attack is just much, much more safe for sort of the basic, basic functionality. But when you, again, when you have assets that you're, you, you demand less security of, I think proof of stake is a great alternative. I love the analogies, you know, that analogy of securities versus gold and the work you need to put in. It's such an easy way to kind of understand the differences. And you're talking about risk, and I think that is the perfect transition to Rune to DeFi risk and what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis at Gauntlet. And a lot of people are all about, oh my God, a thousand percent APY, or I can farm this, and I'm, I have three layers of collateral and all this craziness, and, and really think about trying to milk and get all the juice out of the system. Uh, but very few actually discuss risk openly. So I'd love for you to educate us and my grandma Susie out there on what are the risks behind DeFi and, and what are some things you've analyzed and realized through all your great work? Yeah, so I think one thing to start with is we should partition uh, DeFi risk into sort of two categories to start. The first category is pure smart contract risk. So that is, you know, one plus one is supposed to equal two, but someone found uh, a way to call a function like add such that one plus one equals five, right? And that's sort of just a bug in like the execution of the, the contract, not a bug in usage. On the other hand, there's financial risk, and that's, that's what we focus on, which is dependent on the usage of the protocol. So the protocol, the code can be perfectly correct, but under certain market conditions, uh, the user behavior will, will cause uh, rug pulls, for rug instance, pulls, yeah. right? Because the rug pull, a lot of the rug pulls are not actually something that's wrong with the code. A lot of them are everyone you know, it's a kind of a game where a chicken where everyone is like looking at the, the, the rates and if everyone pulls liquidity at the same time, then the last one to pull liquidity will take the worst hit. And so there's sort of these, uh, these sort of, I don't know if you want to call them attacks or strategies that are financial in nature that impact the expected return of the market participant and the user. And so those are not bugs in the logic that is executed. Those are bugs in, well, expected user behavior and the different types of, of users that exist in the system. You didn't expect a certain type of user to exist, and it turns out there's way more of them, and now they're taking all of the reward, and the other users are getting none. Another sort of way of thinking about these financial attacks that I, I sort of like a little bit is, have you ever seen the movie Office Space? Yes, yes. So in Office Space, there's basically this, this company, these engineers find this hack, where they can give themselves, they can increase their salary by like some number of basis points a day. So they're earning, they're like increase their salary by 0.01%. And then the next day they increase it by 0.01%. And they didn't think about compounding. And so at some point they actually give themselves the entire company's cash and the company's about to go bankrupt. And you know, every, you know the entire movie is sort of a, a based off that. But this idea that someone can find one sort of like tiny loophole of like how in, in terms of how the contract is st structured to basically keep giving themselves like one a little more than every everyone else and then they eventually take everything that's the type of attack that i think uh we we want to talk about when we talk about financial attacks smart contract attacks i mean for better or worse the 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 main tools we have are human audits um we have some automation around that so there is like fuzzing so fuzzing is I put in random inputs into the contract and see what the outputs are and if, if there's any sort of correlation or some type of, tra we trap, we run through some edge case, uh, we should be able to detect it. But it's not foolproof because it's, it's sort of random search. Then there's formal verification where you actually try to say, here are the pro here's the high level property I want to preserve. Uh, when you add liquidity, the amount of liquidity should only go up, and when a trade is executed against it, the slippage should go down. And you make these high-level rules, and you say, okay, like try to prove that this is always true in this contract, and if not, find a counterexample.
Uh, formal verification is great in, in theory. Uh, it's sort of okay in practice, but the problem is it's actually very hard. It's still very manual because you have to write the rules that are the properties you want to hold uh, in the system. It's not like you can fully automatically determine what the properties are. Um, so there's still a lot of human intervention. So what ends up happening is the best auditors are those with um, lots of experience reading code and they kind of have a almost photographic memory of prior incidents. So they have like this library of like, oh, this type of pattern looks like something that could go wrong. And they also use these automation tools, but they're very smart about how they use them. Um, for financial risk, however, the, the, the difference in DeFi which, versus traditional finance is that all of the data is public. So you can see the entire loan book on Aave or Compound. You can see the entire outstanding collateral position of Yearn all publicly. And the fact that that data is public means that you can make a much more fine-grained model of what users are doing in these systems. And so the way we assess risk is we take in new data every day from centralized exchanges, from on-chain uh, sources, and then we try to basically say, what types of users do we see uh, and fit a model for how they behave? And then we also say, what types of users do we not see who are sort of orthogonal to the actual behavior, who are maybe more malicious, maybe more, uh, in, in some ways, use the protocol differently? And then we run simulations as if it's a game. So we, we say, hey, here's a, here's a robot version of this type of user. Here's a robot version of this type of user. Here's a robot version of this type of user. And then we, we, we simulate, like, hey, what would happen if like this the price dropped 50%, how would these users interact with the protocol? And then you run millions of those simulations, and then you can say, hey, uh, this parameter kind of makes sense, or this kind of interest rate doesn't make sense. Fascinating, that is so cool. So in terms of like examples of like low risk, high risk, you know, if we had the Moody's or S&P, we have AAA, you know, platforms and different rating systems, you know, how would it work for you? Like some people kind of think that proof of stake is the AAA because it's just validator delegating your nodes, but maybe lending is a little bit riskier, then yield farm is a bit riskier, and then multiple layer farming is even riskier. Like how would you, like what are some good examples for you of a, for instance, a low risk DeFi platform versus a high risk DeFi platform? Yeah. For sure. I, I think the lending protocols are the compound uh, inflation-ish bug notwithstanding are probably the, the safest bets still in DeFi. Um, I think the there's not a clean hierarchy um, between safety, I think, in these systems because of composability. Because you can all use one protocol in another protocol and it now commingles their risk, it's not totally, you can't uh, cleanly se segment it. Um, but that's the beauty of these systems is that because they're composable, you can actually do these things and look at the risk, but you can't really fractionalize or really discretize the risk into this is the safest versus this is less safe. You can say, relatively speaking, like, hey, this type of activity has a significant high, a higher level of margin and, and things can go wrong there. Um, but I, I do think it's, it, is, it is hard to get to the discrete rating of like A, 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 B. Um, and part of the nature of that is, is the fact that users will find ways to use these protocols in ways that the developers completely don't intend, and that's, that's, that's the beauty of crypto, but also that will happen like way further in the future. Like Someone builds a new protocol that uses an existing protocol, and all of a sudden it changes the actual risk profile of both of those protocols, mm -hmm. right? So that's why you have to kind of, you know, in my mind, take this approach of, really doing rigorous numerical simulation to see what what things look like when you compose these uh, properties. Because it's actually extremely hard, even for formal verification, uh, to handle composability um, and, and to write out all these properties. Um, they sort of grow exponentially in how many times you compose something. And so that, that should give you some sense into why the more you're composing, the more risk you have. But also, of course, that's the beauty of this system versus like traditional finance where you know all the composability is happening but the ha where it's happening is lawyers writing the contracts yeah. right and you you as the owner of the contract don't actually even know what what's in it right in some ways 
it kind of reminds me a little bit like the the subprime, you know, the CDOs, you know, where they just layering multiple things. But like as you said, it's much more liquid. You it's transparent. You know what are being done with the funds, et cetera, et cetera. But your point on composability makes a lot of sense because it's so interconnected that it's really hard to put a score or a rating. We spent a lot of time trying to construct types of things like that, um, especially in terms of like measuring like what is the value at risk for the whole protocol or the value at risk for certain types of users. But, you know, when you get into the details of that, it actually is quite nuanced into like what you should count as like value at risk. So for instance, in a urine strategy, let's say I deposit ETH and then urine goes and trades for USDC and then puts it into a convex or curve LP share. Should I count? Should I measure everything in ETH terms? Should I measure everything in curve terms? or maybe it's like ETH staked ETH uh, for this example, should I measure everything in, in convex terms? Like which protocol's asset should be the numeraire? The economics or finance jargon, a numeraire is the asset that you measure your, uh, you measure your portfolio in, right? So like if I have a portfolio of euros, uh, dollars, and yen, if I am a U.S. investor, I will convert I'll take the exchange rate to dollars and measure everything in terms of my portfolio as a dollar. But if I'm in Europe, I might, I will do that with euros. And though the choice of numerator can lead to some like subtle distinctions, uh, different behaviors and the properties of the portfolio. And in some sense, you have this problem in a more egregious way in crypto because there's so many currencies and so many derivatives on these currencies that what the choice of numerator is is not obvious. I, I can't really tell you what your ETH value at risk is. So that's why you have to be kind of diligent and careful about tracking things. And then over time, I think we'll make best standards and best practices for how to. That makes a lot of sense. And by the way, guys, if there are any type of risks that we haven't mentioned, please put them in the comments box below so that you can earn some free tokens and a free airdrop. And the last question for you, my friend, before we go, so far it's been mind blowing. Seriously, you've provided with such incredible insight. I really, really appreciate every single bit. The question for the future of DeFi, right? Yeah. And I know I noticed on the stage, you talked a little bit about NFTs and gaming platforms, and it seemed like you guys really had a consensus on that's where we're going. But uh, give us a little bit of a, a glimpse of the future of DeFi, it'd be wonderful. The thing I'm personally most interested in that actually we didn't really talk about that much on the panel is how to make DeFi private um, or like, you know, how can you provide privacy while also making, giving all these great properties of composability, transparency, et cetera. Um, and one interesting thing about DeFi versus the rest of crypto is that, you know, you may have no other privacy cryptocurrencies like Monero or Zcash or, or things like that, but they have this thing where they blind the transaction completely. And so you don't know the sender or the receiver modular whatever security assumptions they make. In DeFi, however, you have this problem of some of the data has to be public no matter what, right? I have prices. If Uniswap doesn't show me the price, yeah. then like why would I trade against it, right? Yeah. So there's public data, like pricing data, that needs to be completely public and transparent. And then there's private data that's maybe like my balances or like some other properties about me and identity, NFTs I hold, whatever that is. And partitioning the public and private such that if I know the public information, I can learn about the private stuff is actually a quite difficult problem because it, it you know, it, for instance, in Uniswap, let's pretend we have this sort of straw man privacy preserving decks where the balances of the users are kept completely private, but the prices are public. If the mechanism looks like Uniswap, we proved actually in this paper from March that you can, you can basically invert what the trade sizes are. So you kind of lose privacy in these Uniswap models. Like it's easy to use, but that ease comes with the fact that you can't get privacy for free with it. Even though, I mean, there were a lot of people who raised money on these things that were trying to be like, we're going to be a private Uniswap, and maybe some of them are more dubious than others. But the, the main thing to note is that the fact that there is this public data that you can analyze post hoc and infer something about the private information about the users sort of says that DeFi has to come up with new mechanisms for privacy that are able to basically still provide public transparency while also 
uh, not letting that public transparency imply things about the, the thing data that's supposed to be private. Um, so I think that space is probably one of the most unsearched but fruitful places we will find amazing new things in, in D5 with. Because I do think that the average person does not like this idea that like everything is public all the time. Like it's just like I can't imagine my parents being like, hey, we want all of our bank information like publicly. It's not like they're they have anything to hide or anything, but they also are not used to that kind of model. And I think like of course people on on the edge, like people in crypto, young people don't don't care as much. But I, I do think there will be this reckoning where we do actually have to somehow partition this stuff. And so personally that's the thing I'm most interested in. Um, I also uh, run sort of a, a, a venture fund. And one of the things that I think we spend a bunch of time investing in is uh, in NFT fractionalization. And I think these kind of things that blend DeFi and NFTs are going to be super, super important. So one thing we talked about on the panel was sort of uh, how blockchain gaming like flips the traditional models of um, you know, how game development works and how game economics works, you know, at a very, very high level. Like the main reason that is, is that traditionally Blizzard or a game produced game studio owns all the IP. They own all the characters. They own all your items. They own all the like data you've produced while playing the game. And in the blockchain gaming world, the IP is owned by the users. The, the designer doesn't really own it anymore. Um, and one thing that I think will be interesting is like if you think about all the value that game studios capture for themselves, where does that value go when the items are are now owned by the users? Well, some of it is in what, what we're seeing in NFT land of like people flipping NFTs. But I, and you know, I guess this is recorded, so I, I you can you can have my prediction is that there is sort of a, a fat protocol thesis for NFTs, which is that. If you have these systems where the users own all their items, all of the value that gets accrued, a lot of it will go to the DeFi protocols because the DeFi protocols will be the only way to go between different types of assets on different chains. And, and you know, as we enter a cross-chain world, effectively, the protocols that provide you liquidity, that let you borrow against your game assets, that let you move between different chains, different, different games, like imagine you have an item that you can use in multiple places, you need the facilitation of that by DeFi protocols or things that we call DeFi protocols now that might not look exactly like the ones we have right now. And I think the future will be this, this idea that like, if the users own their items, the value capture is done by the protocol. That makes a lot of sense. And the balance between public and private data on top of the future of NFTs and Tokenization makes a lot, a lot of sense. Thurun, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thanks Legend, having all the way Thank from New you. York. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and join us every week premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys.